Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Muhai's online public interview series. For those of us who've joined us for the first time, thanks for so much for tuning in. As we're all aware, COVID-19 has brought great change to the way we learn and work in such dramatically different circumstances. Making the most of our effort and energy is more difficult than ever before. For this reason, in semester two of Muhai's public interview series, we've managed to bring in some, some of Australia's leading experts in the field of productivity to help us overcome some of these very relevant and prominent struggles for us students. For today's interview, uh, we're joined by Mr. Dermot Crowley. Thank you for joining us and giving us your time today. My pleasure, great to be here. Before we start with the questions, we've got a lot to go through. Um, can you give us a brief introduction? Yeah, absolutely. So um, I'm, I'm originally from Dublin, Ireland. I came out to Australia 27 years ago um, as a backpacker and um, I ended up falling in love and, and getting married and, and uh, been in Australia ever since. Um, along the way, I started working for a time management training company way back in the 1990s. And, and this was before technology was even on the scene. And it was back in the days when people primarily use paper diary systems to organize themselves, but I, I fell in love with productivity and, and everything to do with it. And I started my own business um, about 18 years ago with the, uh, the idea of uh, linking technology and theory. So I wanted to teach people good theory around how they organize themselves, but I wanted them to implement it using the technology. And I, I guess that's my sweet spot. I, I tend to um, work in a lot of organizations where I'm, I'm helping people to leverage their technology to work more productively. So that's pretty much what I've done for the last 18 years. And from what I, what I know, uh, you founded Adapt Productivity, a company back in 2002. Uh, so you've mentioned your interest in technology as well as um, helping people time manage. What were your other personal motivations for starting this company? Uh, look, um, when I was young, I don't think if someone had said to me that I'd own my own business and um, that I would have believed them. Uh, so it was never a burning desire for me, but um, productivity was uh, a burning desire and there was no one out there doing what I did at the time. And, and to be honest, even still, it's, it's still quite niche, this idea of taking technology and, and productivity theory and, and really specializing in that. There's not a lot of people doing it. So I saw an opportunity and um, I guess I backed myself. I, I, um, I gave myself six months to uh, make a success of it. And I've got to be honest and say for the first five months, uh, I didn't really have any success whatsoever. Uh, and I had a six month old baby at the time. So um, it was a little bit, a bit scary, but luckily, at the end of that fifth month, I got my first big contract and uh, I never looked back. So um, I guess I, I felt that I had a, um, uh, uh, there was a need out in the marketplace that needed to be filled and I felt that I could do that. And um, I think it's, uh, it's, it's held me in good stead. I mean, for, from the student's perspective, it definitely is a huge component of how we carry it. Uh, on with our academics, which is productivity. Mm -hmm. And with this modern technology, it is also very important that we make the most use of that to help us. Um, do you have any examples of some of the changes that you brought to individuals or institution? Yeah, look, I, I tend to deal with productivity on two different levels, uh, at the, the personal productivity level and at the team productivity level. So, when it comes to personal productivity, I probably see people um, unfortunately struggle to manage their actions effectively. And I think this is equally true of students, uh, you know, um, as it is for people who work in corporates. Uh, most people don't have good systems around how they manage their actions. So their actions are a combination of their, their meetings and their tasks so you know it doesn't matter what you do whether you're a student or whether you're uh, working in an organization your, your week is made up of a, a series of fixed time commitments which might be meetings or lectures or um, any work that has to be done at a specific time 
uh, I would class that as a fixed time commitment. And then the other side of your work is a series of tasks or priorities that need to get done, and they're much more flexible in nature. And what I've found over the years is most people use a calendar to manage their meetings. Um, and even students hopefully would uh, start to kind of get into that mindset that if it's not in my calendar, I might forget to go to the meeting or to the lecture. So I'm, uh, you know, I think the first thing we need to do is make sure that we're not trying to remember these activities in our head because our head is not very good at remembering things at the right time. We've got a system in place to manage it and most people would use a calendar for the meetings. But when it comes to their tasks and their priorities, that's where I find most people are really struggling because they haven't found a system that helps them to manage that workload effectively. And I think that technology can really help us in that regard. Yeah, I mean, I personally use a calendar and a diary still on paper, though. Is there any uh, technology uh, or apps that you can recommend students so that they can keep up to their schedule? Yeah, look, there's, uh, there's a thousand and one different apps out there that will allow you to do things like create task lists or, or you know, to manage your, your schedule. Um, and they're all very good. I have no problem with the apps that are out there. So I could mention, you know, things like um, To Doodle and, and Don't Forget the Milk and Things, um, Evernote. There's a, a ton of different apps, but my firm belief is if you want to learn to manage your time well and manage your time holistically, you really should be using a, a tool that allows you to bring both your meeting workload and your task workload together because they both need time to get done. And the mistake I see a lot of people make is they use a, an electronic calendar for their meetings, but then they just write out a to-do list. And that's better than nothing. But the problem with a to-do list is you're not managing your time around that stuff. You're not actually making decisions about when do I need to do that. And there's a greater risk that you will leave things until the last minute and end up having to um, deal with stuff when it becomes urgent. And I, I only need to mention the word assignments to most students and ask them, when do you tend to do your assignments? And so many of them would say to me, I tend to do them at the very last minute. I, I, I pull an all nighter and I, I get through it. And that's okay, okay, you might get through it, but your stress levels go up, the quality of your work goes down. And if you carry that behavior into the workplace, unfortunately, you begin to impact on other people's deadlines and other people's work, and that's not acceptable. So I think we need to learn to work in a, a more proactive way than that. So having a tool that allows you to manage both your meetings and your tasks in one place is invaluable. Um, the best tool for the job depends on what you're using for your email, because a lot of the things that end up in your calendar are driven by email because you receive meeting invitations. And a lot of the things that end up in your task list are also driven by email. So I would say, if you've got a student who's using Gmail for their email system, then using Google Calendar and Google Tasks is the, the best um, platform for managing their time. If they were using Microsoft Office, for their email, then I would suggest using Outlook and its calendar and its task list to manage their time. They, they will be the two main organizing platforms out there. And I believe that they are absolutely the best tools for the job. Yeah, I can completely agree with that. Um, a lot of students are on Gmail or Microsoft, but I'm not sure if a lot of students actually make the most out of the Google Calendar or mm. other external um, applications that you've mentioned. We'll just slightly shift the focus to the current climate, COVID-19. There's been a huge transition for us onto a virtual platform, which we're not used to, not used to the Zoom meetings and having this content delivered online. Mm. What do you think are the biggest challenges that we face as we study at home? Yeah, look, I'm, I'm seeing this firsthand. My, um, my son is in his first year of, of uni and um, he had three weeks 
of the uni experience and then the rest of the time has been pretty much in his bedroom. So um, that has been a challenge. So look, I would say the first thing is just having so much screen time, you know, whether you're attending tutorials or lectures or whether you're, you're catching up on pre-recorded videos or you're meeting with your, um, uh, your uni mates, it's just a lot of time on screen. So I think compartmentalizing your day and, and trying to make sure that you have some space away from your desk where you can work and, and uh, you know, maybe read or, or, or study. I think that that's a good idea. Uh, I think structuring your day so you're not just sitting in front of the screen all day long. So making sure that you're getting up regularly, going for walks, um, getting exercise, uh, doing a different type of activity that requires a different type of um, cognitive interaction. I, I, I personally find Zoom meetings or whatever the equivalent might be, they're exhausting because you, you have to really concentrate hard to understand what's going on. Uh, because when we're in a meeting in, in the real world, we, we pick up on a lot of visual cues in a meeting. We see people's body language. We can read their face and we can decipher their tone of voice to understand what's going on. In a Zoom meeting, it's much harder to do that. So we have to concentrate really hard on what people are saying. And um, that's just tiring. So I, I reckon breaking our day up uh, is, is going to be really, really essential. I also feel that having a good system in place to organize what you need to do is, is really even more important in this COVID situation. And for me, having electronic tools to do that for you makes a lot of sense. Uh, and it makes sense that if you're going to use a tool on your computer to organize yourself, you, you need to make sure that it also synchronizes to your phone or your, your lap, your, your iPad or whatever you might be using so that you've basically got one system to organize yourself, but you can access that system through your PC, through your phone, through your tablet, and it's seamless integration. So that will facilitate you moving away from your bedroom, if that's where you're studying, and still be able to be productive, whatever space you're in. Mm. Uh, we'll just talk a bit about your book, Smart Work. Um, can you shed some light on how, or tips, on how students can make the most out of their technology. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So um, this, I uh, just happen to have one uh, here, Smart Work. This was um, published about four years ago now. Um, Smart Work is all about personal productivity. And, and basically, I, I look into three core areas that you need to organize in your world. And again, it doesn't matter whether you're a student or um, the CEO of an organization, we all need to organize ourselves. Um, in Smart Work, I talk about um, actions, inputs, and outcomes. So your, your actions is, is what I mentioned a few minutes ago, the idea that we need to centralize all of our actions into one tool. So whether they be meetings or, or tasks, we should be managing our time around that stuff and centralizing it all. There's a, there's a really um, liberating feeling that you get when you stop using your head to try and remember what you need to do and you trust the system to do it. So I, I don't carry things around in my head. If, I, if I've got a meeting, it's gonna be in my calendar. If I've got a task that I need to do, it's gonna be in my task list. So I'm, I've got real clarity over what I need to do. So for me, that's the foundation piece. Then the inputs piece is about how people manage their incoming work. And look, I have a feeling that this is gonna change. So some of the students who might be watching this now, by the time you guys hit the workplace, email might not be the, the main driver of, of workflow. Uh, it certainly is now. And, you know, I reckon it will change, but we still need to be able to manage communications effectively. And, and the big problem that I see with how people manage email, and I'm talking more about a corporate context here, many people have 
thousands and thousands of emails sitting in their inbox and they kind of don't care. You know, I'm sure, you know, you guys are the same. You just get emails. I know my son says to me, who cares dad? You know, it's just, it's just email. I just leave it in my inbox. But when you're in a corporate workplace, those email communications carry work in them and you need to be responsive to that work. And that means that you need to have real clarity around what needs action and what doesn't need action. And I believe that if you're operating with hundreds or thousands of emails in your inbox, there's a greater chance that things are going to slip through the cracks and you're going to forget to deal with them. So one of the things that I teach in smart work is the idea of getting your inbox down to zero on a regular basis. So my expectation of people is at least once a week, you have absolutely nothing in your inbox. Now that means of course, that you need to delete some emails. Um, there's lots of emails that you don't need. So let's kill them and get rid of them as quickly as possible. You might need to file some emails and I'm all for keeping emails. I have no problem with that. I just don't keep them in my inbox because my inbox is like my desk. It's a workspace. It's not a storage system. So I've got one filing folder. That's it. I don't have 57 different folders. I've got one filing folder. If I don't need to keep it, I delete it. If I do need to keep it, I file it. Simple. And then I search for what I want when I need it. But then the key is the emails that might require action from me, I make sure that I either do them or I put them in my calendar or I put them in my task list. And this is why I was saying to you earlier on that it makes sense to use either Gmail or Outlook as your main organizing tool because a lot of your work is driven by email and both Gmail and Outlook have the ability to take an email and convert it into a task that you can schedule for tomorrow and it links the email to the task or you could schedule the email into your calendar so you block out time so you don't forget to deal with that piece of work. And if, if you're doing that, that you don't need to leave the email in your inbox anymore. You can safely file it. And then when you need to do it, you've got everything you need within the task. So for me, this idea, the connection between your inputs and your, your, your actions is really, really important. And these tools, Outlook and, and Gmail, they were designed to do this. It's just Google and, and Microsoft forgot to tell everyone and very few people, even in the corporate workplace, very few people use the tools to do this effectively. I think it's a very relevant point that you've pointed out there. Um, I personally have thousands of emails that are unread and unchecked and it does get super overwhelming mm -hmm. and a lot of important information can go missing. Yeah. Um, so I'll go home and get that done straight away. <laughs> yeah, look, I'd probably go back a couple of weeks yeah. And then anything older than that, just highlight it and put it into a filing folder and then make some decisions about what's left and, and you'll get it to zero very quickly. And, and it's such a good feeling mm. because you actually, um, you actually feel like you're in control of your work. And, and that's the thing that I worry about. So many young people feel out of control. There's so many things that are outside of your control at the moment, especially during COVID. We're all feeling very vulnerable. So why not take control of something that you can control, which is your inbox and, and be organized and stay on top of it. Mm. Control things that you can, I guess. Exactly. Exactly. Just on that note, uh, you did also mention um, the feeling of uh, stress and urgency. That is another book that you have written. Mm -hmm. um, can you tell us about some of the most use, useful ways in relieving that feeling of overwhelming stress and urgency yeah yeah absolutely so um i'm plugging all my books today so i've just published my new book urgent um which is <laughs> I, I wrote urgent because a lot of the organizations that i work with and they be banks and law firms and manufacturing organizations and consulting uh, organizations so um there's a wide range of them a lot of them are very much driven by urgency. So there's often a culture where everything is urgent, everything's needed now, everything is needed yesterday. And it's very stressful to work in a culture uh, where everything seems urgent. And the problem I've got with urgency is um, 
there can be good urgency. So we need, we all need urgency to get traction and to build momentum. There's no doubt about that. If you can imagine if there was no deadlines, like if you think about your assignments, if you didn't have a deadline for an assignment, you probably wouldn't bother doing it. And so the deadline is designed to give us something to work towards. But the problem is that there's a lot of unproductive urgency where we're dealing with things that either seem urgent, but they're not. So that's what I call fake urgency. So there's a lot of that that happens. There's a lot of stuff that goes, I'm urgent. And actually it's not. A lot of emails carry urgency because you've got email alerts turned on. And every time you get an email, it goes bing on your phone. And that, that creates this sense of urgency, but it's, it's actually a fake urgency. So we want to get rid of that if we can. But we also have um, what I call avoidable urgency. And that's urgency that is created when other people leave things until the last minute and they hit a deadline and then they pass it to us and say, I, I need this today. Or we leave things until the last minute and now we have to clean up our own mess. And I reckon that that unproductive urgency causes a lot of stress. And again, the quality of our work goes down and if you're in the, the workplace um, and you're working in a way that uh, creates this unproductive urgency, you're actually having a really negative impact on the people around you. No one likes to work with someone who's just totally disorganized and leaves everything until the last minute. So I think that we need to learn to moderate urgency and dial it up when it's necessary, but also we need to be able to dial it down when we see that it's just unproductive. Yeah, um, that was, those are really useful points that you addressed there. I think stress is a very prominent, prominent part, I'm sure, in the workplace as well, but with students. And it's been amplified during this pandemic. Um, so that was a quick review of your book. Um, I'm certainly reading it now as well. And for students who, want and who are overwhelmed, make sure that you go check that out. Um, that's all we have time for today. Um, are there any or any tips that you want to discuss or any final words? Look, final words um, would be, it's never too early to get yourself organized. I, my, my experience working with students in the past has been, I don't need to do that now, but I'm not in the workplace yet. I'll, I'll get organized when I get a job. But I reckon that organizations are expecting a certain level of professionalism and organization when you come in. I, uh, I run the graduate productivity program for um, uh, the likes of the Commonwealth Bank. And one of the first things that the bank does is it has the, the graduates come through my, my productivity program so that they get organized on day one. So don't leave it until then. You're gonna have a competitive edge if you're organized before you even hit the workplace and, and you're going to do better in your exams. You're going to be able to study better because you're going to work more proactively. So start as soon as you can. Thank you for your wise words. Um, so that's all we have time for today. I hope everyone watching has enjoyed and I certainly have learned so much more about productivity, urgency, stress management and technology in general. If you want to, once again, figure learn more about these things, go check Mr. Dermot's books. Um, thanks again, Dermot, for joining us today on the note. My pleasure. My absolute pleasure. Thank you.